Last week, I strip searched the streets for a soldier poet struggling to make life rhyme with a bullet splintered shin and one long 25 to life knife to the forehead. He's still alive, blind in one eye, rushed from pimp walk to gimp walk by a symphony of sirens, heartbeat who banging on his rib cage, only 18 years of age. I found his homeboy dying from the same disease, dry eyes screaming, please release me from this two bedroom tomb, this dope smoke filled emergency room, this prison skin, rice paper thin, tattoos like open sores, toe tagging in the AIDS ward, still trying to be hardcore. Don't call me doctor, I'm not one. I don't laugh at jokes, but I got one. About a kid with no father, I taught one. His enemigos rolled up, he shot one. They fired back, he caught one. Now he's looking for answers. I brought one, an empty notebook with lines. I bought one for $1.99, less than a gun. Last week, I strip searched the streets for a soldier poet struggling to make life rhyme with hard time. I found him on page three, right next to me, scratching his way back to the beginning with nothing but a pencil for protection in this madhouse of correction we all call body. So 15 years ago, I started volunteer teaching a poetry workshop in a Los Angeles County juvenile detention camp at a time in my own life when I had sold my soul, or at least my voice, to the Hollywood studio system. Uh, I had been paid very well to turn something that had been very close to my heart into something that was wholly unrecognizable to me. And I was in crisis. Uh, it was out of desperation, really, that I answered an ad in the Writers Guild Journal looking for writers to go work with incarcerated youth to do a little workshop up there. So I went, and when I got up there, um, I started to, I looked at these guys that were all, and they were eager, and they, some of them had already had poems in their hands. And, uh, and uh, I was expecting them to do this big sales pitch, but I didn't. They were, it was almost like they were waiting for me. And it reminded me of how important writing had been to me, the sort of pure writing as a, as a teenager in terms of finding my own identity. And I also recognized in them a sense that I was feeling at that time myself, which that, is that we had betrayed ourselves. So there was an immediate kind of kinship that developed there, and I just kept going back um, every week for two hours, every Wednesday night. And as I did that, my heart started to open more and more. Their hearts started to open more and more. They, got, they started to explore wounds and talk about the, their history of abuse, what they'd been through, what they'd done. Tears were shed in that room. And the more that happened, the greater the sense of responsibility I felt to create some kind of community outside that facility to which those young people could connect once they got released back to the streets, because I knew they were going back into the same fire that they had come out of. So that's really how Street Poets was born. Um, we started as, a, as six formerly incarcerated youth, actually and me, their road manager, which is not an easy gig, I can tell you that right now, but um, uh, uh, going around and performing in the community. And, and one of the things that I felt a real sense of responsibility about was that at that time, especially in California, there was a huge tough on crime thing happening. Um, there was all, the trend was toward trying more youth as adults. Um, all the politicians' language around it was to demonize these kids. Um, and then the other thing that was happening, which was also sort of insane, was, was uh, the explosion of gangster rap. So the entertainment industry at the same time was amplifying their false personas, the shells that they wore to keep their authentic selves protected. Um, so, and then people were getting rich off of gangster rap. Very few actual kids in the hood were getting rich, a few, but mostly it was the corporations. So I felt a need to bring some truth into that, what felt like an ocean of lies. And that's how that group, that performance group got started. And then we, we sort of branched out from there. We started holding these open mics that you see here. And we, we started a recording studio to amplify those voices even more. And during those first eight years of the work, my role became a kind of Mr. Fix-It. I was, like that poem said, I was doing a lot of strip searching of streets. Spent a lot of time in my car looking for guys, 
why weren't you where you said you were going to be, you know? Whatever the thing was, uh, if someone needed a job, I tried to find them a job. If someone needed a car, I tried to find a church program that would donate cars. If someone needed um, someone to talk them out of shooting their girlfriend's father at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm, I'm your guy. Um, and it got, it got to the point where the, the, all the sort of crisis management that I was doing started to feel like, like that was my life. It was all, it was like I, I started to become the crisis. Um, physically, I started to, to, everything started to kind of freeze up in my body. I got, I'm not a limber guy to begin with, and every, I was like, you know. Um, and, uh, and I was kind of, I, I think I'd become a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, too, because you're, when you're working with young people who are dancing with death on a daily basis, it keeps you in the moment. Every conversation has potential life or death consequences. At least that's how, in my head, I was experiencing it at that time. And, um, so that feeling of tension that started to build over a number of years culminated in a real tragedy. Um, one of the kids who had been closest to me, a 19-year-old, was shot and killed on his 19th birthday. Um, his name was Eric Henderson. And he was the first guy who'd actually died, that we'd lost from our inner circle. Um, I think I was kind of laboring under the illusion that our guys would be OK if they, if they were plugged into street poets. And this blew that out of the water for me. Um, it was a guy who had made all these huge changes in his life. And it just was one of those wholly tragic things. And two days after his funeral, I was at the office. And, I, and another mentee of mine came by, a, a guy I'd known for four years. I met when he was 14 years old in juvenile detention camp. He had just graduated from high school which was a minor miracle, because this kid was really struggling with addiction. I don't, it was a real group effort of a number of people in his life to help him get through high school. He managed to get through. And he came to see me at the office to tell me thank you and goodbye. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? You know, you just graduated from high school. You're going to college, man. We're, we're, we're good here, you know. We're, we got junior college already lined up. And uh, he told me that he had been uh, jumped in to his gang, to a gang. Um, he, this is a kid who had avoided the gang thing in his neighborhood until he graduated from high school, and then he decided to join a gang. And I thought he was joking at first. Um, and it turns out it was like the older members of the gang, these guys who were in their 30s, who jumped him in. So not only did he get jumped in, he got jumped in on a level that it was very difficult to extract oneself from. And he knew that, and he was scared, scared to death. Um, but he, he, he basically, there was nothing that was going to convince him otherwise. And I felt wholly powerless to do anything. And it was that combined with the funeral I had just been to. And it just felt like my world and the way I had approached that work was just was, was dying. Um, I remember when he left that day, I told him, I'll be there for you when, you when you work your way through whatever you're going through right now. And it was the first time I had said those words where I felt like that might not be true that I was really not sure I could keep doing what I had been doing, or at least keep doing it in the way that I've been doing it. So um, this picture here you see on the, is, a, is a picture of a retreat place in Mendocino, actually. I love that we're in Mendocino right now, because uh, this was the turning point for me. I got an invitation out of the blue to a place called, uh, to a, this Mosaic Multicultural Foundation retreat in the Mendocino Woodlands. It's a men's retreat, 100, 100 men, all different backgrounds, ex, ex cons, professionals trying to reinvent themselves, all you know, aging hippies, and uh, not too different from what we're looking at here in some ways. And, uh, and I got up there, and I walked into a room, and there was a, there was a story being told. And it got to a point in the story where it talked about brothers fighting with each other, and something in me just broke. It was like a water main break just exploded. And I remember just tears pouring out of me. And I was sitting in a really uncomfortable folding chair and just doubled up. And the tears just kept coming and coming and coming. And it was just this ocean of grief. And I remember at first, I, I knew what I was crying about. And then suddenly, it just became about our whole society. I mean, I felt like I was crying for everyone and everything and all the kids that I'd seen and all the pain and all the, and it, it, 
it, at first, I felt like I was literally being ripped apart. It was excruciatingly painful. And then at a certain point, in the midst of those tears, I remember surrendering to them, just being like, this is too big. I can't resist this. And when that happened, the pain stopped. I mean, I was still feeling, I guess I would say the suffering stopped. And the tears kept coming, but it started to feel like a river that was carrying me someplace. It was moving something in me. It was, it was moving me. It was, in a sense, like carrying me home. And then the tears started to almost feel sweet. And I cried for something like three hours. I still can't believe how much water was in my body, because I remember my clenched fists just being drenched and tears just coming out of me. Like, and um, and I, I emerged from that experience uh, a changed person. Um, it was what I needed. And it allowed me to kind of reinvent myself in this work um, and, and go back into that community in a different way and a different level. So um, I want to jump to the, the subject of, uh, of, um, of this talk, which is the magic bullet, how to heal a violent culture. Number one, there's three things we need more of. This is the first, more pain. As a culture, we need more pain. And there's a great, great quote from the Sufi mystic poet Rumi that's the cure for the pain is in the pain. If you had told, said that to me before my experience of the tears, I would not have, I would have been like, ah, interesting idea, you know, I don't really get it. I get it now. And, and, uh, and you'll find in a lot of some of the mystic poets of the world the kind of language that supports this sort of idea. But as a culture, um, this is something we need to learn uh, or remember, I guess, and it would be a better way of saying it. And indigenous cultures understand this idea. They understand the idea that our gifts, the things that we were born to bring into this world, lie within us right beside our wounds. You can't get to your gift, to the medicine that you were meant to share with others, unless you're willing to feel the pain of your wounds. And that, to me, is a fundamental idea that we've forgotten about. And certainly the pharmaceutical companies in our culture have forgotten about um, the idea that you have to feel it to heal it on some level. Um, pain opens the heart. And when the heart opens, our vision opens, um, our ability to see beyond the surface of things. When I got back from this retreat, I, the first person I wanted to call was that kid who had left me on the rooftop. I just had a feeling something had shifted in me. Maybe I could engage him in a different way. I called him up. He'd been running the streets for something like three or four months at that point and really looked horrible. And we went to this old Mexican restaurant in LA. And I sat down across the table from him. And as he began talking, I noticed, I noticed uh, a snake-like mist, dark mist, moving from his belly up through his heart, in and out of his neck, and then up into his face. And I didn't really know what I was looking at, but something in me just said out loud, what was that? And he looked at me and he said, you can see that? And I got chills. And I said, yeah, I can see that. And then he smiled and he looked away. And then he looked back at me and said, he wants to talk to you. So. I'm in the middle of a restaurant. There's other people eating around me. This is like we're having this conversation. The waiter's coming in and out every once in a while. I said, OK, let's, let's talk. Um, and I proceeded to have a five-minute conversation with what I would describe as an, an entity, something that was not this kid, but something that felt very proprietary of this kid. And it basically told me, back off. You don't know what you're doing. He's mine. And was very kind of like, this was the energy, like, get, you know. And, 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 but I remember as I was listening to him talk, I remember thinking, he's scared. There's something in this dude that is scared. It's threatened. And that's why he's putting on such a like, blustery thing. And um, so we talked for about five minutes. And then it kind of went down, went back down into his belly. And uh, I came out of that ex experience, he came out of that experience you know, a little disoriented, did not remember having the conversation. It was five minutes that he blanked out. Um, we went outside. I had him breathe in sunlight. We, you know, I was just kind of trying to work with what I knew how to work with. Um, but I came out of that conversation thinking to myself, I need new mentors. I've been mentoring kids my whole life. This is a time in my life where I, I know I'm seeing what I'm seeing, but I do not know 
who can help me understand it? I definitely didn't learn anything about this at Duke University. You know, they did not have a class. And, um, so <clears throat> I sought out uh, one of the facilitators of that initial retreat was a guy named Maladoma Somme. He's an African elder. Um, and uh, he became a mentor of mine. And one of the things he said to me very early on was, if you can see it, you're meant to work with it. And it was what I needed to hear, because I wasn't sure. You know, I, I felt like I was looking into a dimension or into something that I, I knew I could see into, but I wasn't sure it was, like, it was my role to step into that place. You know, I was nervous about that. So that was a very powerful affirmation for me that led me on a whole journey that's its own talk. Uh, into indigenous healing practices. Um, and I began to bring those practices back to street poets and to the young people that we work with. Um, which brings me to the next thing we need more of in our culture, which is ritual. Um, ritual provides a safe channel through which emotion can be expressed. And when we talk about, you know, if we're going to if we're going to choose as a culture to begin to feel our pain in order to claim our gifts, we need to have spaces in which that's safe to do. Because we've forgotten as a culture how to create those spaces where someone can really break apart and still be held. Um, which is why I think we throw out the life jackets of you know, the, the, the uh, psych psychopharmaceuticals. It's like if someone's drowning and they're feeling depressed, it's like give them, throw them a life jacket, keep, them, keep their head above water when really that person might be somebody who's meant to be a diver, you know, like an abalone, one of those guys who dives down to the bottom of the ocean to find the pearl that's in the, in the depths of our culture. And I think we don't, you know, it's time that we start cultivating a, 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 a new cadre of, of folks in our culture that, can, that are deep sea divers, that can, that can dive deep into the emotions of the culture and explore those deep wounds in order to bring back the kind of medicine, the kind of gifts that can really help transform this culture. Um, so that's the, that's, that we, so we started to bring ritual into the mix. And I'll give you an example of what a ritual looks like, because people have all kinds of different associations with that. The young man who I was talking about, who was the one who was still alive and still with us, um, one of the rituals that he did was a community ritual that was witnessed and held by others where he dug his own grave, dug into the earth. If you've ever dug your own grave before, I don't know if anyone has, but it's a very intense experience because once you get below about two feet into the earth and you're standing there, it starts to work on your psyche in a really interesting way. Um, you start to think about death, and you start to think about the fact that you will be lying in the earth. Your body will be in the earth like this at some point, and, and it really works on you. So even the act of digging that grave is a very powerful thing. And then he was laid in the grave and covered up, totally up to his, up to his neck in this case. Um, there's different versions of that ritual, but this one was one where his head was above the ground. And, and left there, basically, with, a, with someone to witness, someone to make sure no coyotes came sniffing around him or you know, uh, kept him safe, um, while the rest of us kind of stayed as a, in a community fire, you know, playing, playing some drums, singing, just kind of holding vigil for this person. And we left him in there to cook for about four or five hours. And it, on, over the course of those four or five hours, things would come up in him and be shed. It was like he'd, you know, he'd start screaming at some point, and then that would be, come through. He'd start crying. That would, that would disappear, and he'd get very calm. He'd start laughing in this kind of crazy demonic way. That would, like, that would, that would just, so it was, it was like watching layers of a person's energetic being being shed in order for that authentic self to emerge. And this was a young man who had done things in his journey that he could not undo. And one of the things that came to him while he was in the earth, being held in our mother that we all share, you know, that, that earth, was that, was that he wasn't living for himself anymore. He couldn't, he couldn't because of the choices he had made up to that point. He had to be a source of healing for others. And that was the point when he had that realization. That was the point when he said, okay, I'm ready to come out of the ground now. Um, and that's when we took him out. Actually, that's not true. We didn't take him out. An interesting thing, I went over and I said to him, you know, how you feeling, how you doing? And he said, don't, I don't want anyone to dig me out of here. And I said, oh, all right. He's like, when the earth wants me to be let go, she'll let me go. I was like, all right. So we walked away. We kind of gave him his space. It was dark, too. And uh, I went back out there to check on him 20 minutes later, and he was sitting on the edge of the grave. Just He had dug himself out of there, which may not sound like much, but it's extremely difficult to do. Like all those screaming, 
things, crying, laughing things that were coming through him uh, could not get himself out of that grave. So, and we, 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 you know, he was impacted in such a way so that he couldn't make that choice himself. So that was a kind of a remarkable moment and a real rebirth moment for him. And an example of how ritual can be used to, to help heal people, especially from extreme circumstances like he was coming out of. The third thing is more poetry. This is a picture of Walt Whitman, for those of you who don't know. Um, one of our great American poets, the, the American father of free verse. And my first really, well, not my, my first really powerful spiritual experience of my adult life was in college, reading Leaves of Grass um, for a modern American poetry class. I was in my dorm room, and I'd been trying to analyze it. I had my pen out, and I was trying to break up his text and everything. It was not the way to read Whitman. And I, I just started reading it out loud to myself. And as I did that, I suddenly felt this profound sense that like Walt Whitman's spirit was in the room with me. Like I got chills. I got, it was really freaky, um, to be honest, but also incredibly exciting. And I felt I read the entire book in one sitting. I was sitting on the floor. I remember to this day, tears started you know, running down my face. Um, I got in a kind of ecstatic state afterward. Like, if that's possible, what else is possible? And I remember kind of running around my fraternity house at the time, trying to like engage people who were all, all thought I was on, you know, tripping on ecstasy or something. And, uh, and, and, but it, it made an impression. And I had no receptor for that in my life at that time. I knew my life was not set up to, to handle that experience or to really process it. But I think that's the main reason, consciously or unconsciously, that, I brought, that it was poetry that I brought up to the juvenile detention camp six years later when I started teaching up there. Um, yeah. Poetry is like, um, poetry is like, it's a healing tool. It's a delivery system, too, for the medicine. You know, a story like the young man's story who was in the ground, he can write a poem that talks about the shift in his relationship to the earth and what he went through in his healing and his own story and share that in a school in a school that kind of gives everybody a little taste of what it feels what that might feel like to do that ritual work so in our in our community poetry is is a is an entryway it's how we get to know the guys we work with and the girls we work with but then it's also the delivery system for the medicine you know it's the thing, it's the way we share what we do and it's the way we re, we reweave the fabric of community there are certain poems in our community that are, that are like threads of a quilt that have been woven. And there are certain people that are the ones that have, you know, have written those. They're like the, the street poet's greatest hits. But they really hold our community together. Um, so on 9-11-2001, on I was on a plane to New York City with four of our street poets. And, uh, we, we got put down in Kansas City when everything happened at the World Trade Center. And I remember driving back with them in a van, rental van from Kansas City to LA, listening to, on the radio to everything that was going on. We all had our experiences at that time. And, and um, I remember thinking, I wonder how this is going to play out. You know, I was in this group of this carload of guys who, you know, when somebody drives, pulls a drive by on you, and especially kills people, you're immediate reflexes to lash back. And I was curious how the dialogue was going to go in our culture, how, how our leadership was going to respond. Because you know, these kids listen to that. They watch that. They see, they see how we respond. And I was really, needless to say, disappointed with the way that all played out in the wake of that. And it got me thinking about America and our culture. And what if America was, well, was one of my mentees? You know, what would I encourage America to do? And I would say, one is to go back to your childhood wounds and really, really look at those, you know, really sift through those. Um, the legacy of slavery in our country, the treatment of Native American peoples, you know, the things where we all know about, but they're not really part of our, the American story that we, that we broadcast to the rest of the world. Um, so that would be one piece. Um, and I, I, I've written a poem um, with the idea of bringing some of these ideas together, kind of a, a healing poem. It was inspired by a fire ritual that I did actually with Maladoma, um, where I felt a certain guidance from my own ancestors to, 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 to move and say things in a certain way. So um, I'd like to close with another poem, if that's OK with you guys. Um, it's called From the Fire. Um, I want to dedicate it to our ancestors, all of our ancestors. And um, 
goes like this. Let me get some water <laughs> before I get started here. Hmm. My ancestors came to me between the seams of sweat lodged dreams with a request for healing. Hearts muffled and torn by dead silence, born from horrors too big to face, seeking grace on sacred ground paved with false promises. My ancestors came to me to claim responsibility for the rape and enslavement of millions, of one, your son, who was once elder, chief, healer of a tribe that knew nature and beauty like the river knows tears. My ancestors' fears fed flames that consumed original names and songs, turned ancient healing rites to wrongs, harnessed hell for prophets that today build prisons to contain that same shame under different names, bloods, crips, sereños, norteños, hatred fueled by wounds that live in unmarked tombs, watery graves between home and here. There are days when we are all slaves to fear, smoking, drinking, buying, to forget the dead and dying, flying bombs far beyond backyards where bullets trace scars in night skies ripped wide by cries for help. How can one explain a baby sold like crack cocaine as blood rains from her mother's womb? My ancestors came to me with that blood on their hands and the, and the, and the blood of every man child murdered in drive-bys by living lies too high to heal, running the streets between destiny and deceit. Every village burned, every girl turned out by broken boys, once token toys tossed aside by uncles, drunk on night train, still staggering into children's bedrooms, mimicking slave masters, orchestrating disasters for future generations to deny. My ancestors came to me with tears in their eyes and taught me a song that belongs to you and you and you, and maybe someday, me too. Por asa mene, por asa mene, por asa mene, oh, por asa mene, oh, por asa mene,